Hello, welcome to the program. I'm your host, Ron Whitlock. We brought our cameras today to the campuses of the University of Texas at Brownsville and Texas Southmost College, where Chairman and Congressman Raul Grijalba of Arizona brought his hearing to hear why the waivers that Michael Chertoff for the Bush administration has waived many environmental rules to try and hurry up and build the contentious border wall along the natural barrier of the Rio Grande River between the United States and Mexico. Many people talking as to why the wall should not be built, harm it will create. Others talking about why the wall should be built. Now we take you inside to hear those people speaking for and against the border wall. This is the joint hearing of the Natural Resources Subcommittee on National Parks, Forest and Public Lands, and the Subcommittee on Fisheries, Wildlife, Oceans, uh, and that this hearing comes to order. The title of uh, today's hearing is Walls and Waivers, expedited construction of the southern wall, border wall, and collateral impacts on communities and the environments. To examine the history and the culture of the Southwest, to examine its fra fragile and unique ecosystems, to examine the economic and social factors influence immigration, and to examine the pressing need for our national security, and then to decide the only policy solution is a 700-mile fence and a wall is simply a failure of leadership. The wall is not a solution. In my mind, it's a surrender. This wall is an admission of defeat by this administration and the Congress in the face of an important public policy challenge. Likewise, to examine the myriad of laws which protect the air we breathe, the water we drink, and the people's right to know and to participate in the policy process, and then to decide that the only solution is to waive these, those laws completely is an abdication of our responsibility. It is now my pleasure to recognize the chairwoman of our subcommittee of fisheries, wildlife, and oceans for any opening comments she may have. Ms. Bordayo. I am pleased to join you this morning in co-chairing this important oversight field hearing on a matter which generates sharply divergent opinion among members of Congress and within the American public. Few people would challenge the position that the federal government has a fundamental responsibility to secure our nation's borders. However, the methods by which our borders are secured and the manner by which the federal government implements this strategy are also fundamental to the public's acceptance and the government's success in meeting this responsibility. Our free and open system of representative government is built upon the tenets of public participation, robust debate, transparency, and public accountability in decision making. Granted, abiding by these tenets often can mean delays, extra costs, and at times legal challenges. But nonetheless, I believe that the only way our government can succeed and endure is if the people themselves feel vested in the important decisions that must affect their daily lives. Let me now uh, turn to the ranking member, a uh, member of the full resource committee, uh, the gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Tancredo, your comments. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I sincerely appreciate your holding this hearing before our subcommittee today because border security or the lack thereof is an issue that has uh, far-reaching environmental impacts, and I am pleased that we are finally taking time to address it. Environmental degradation, the safety of our national parks and natural resources, and the preservation of the wilderness areas rarely have been considered. In the 1990s, we used fencing to secure the high-volume corridor in San Diego and El Paso, but we left the vast tracts of border vulnerable. The resulting shift of illegal alien activity to areas without fencing is now threatening to destroy fragile wildlife refuges and the treasured national monuments. Illegal aliens and smugglers have created hundreds of new trails and roads while crossing borderlands, and in doing so destroyed saguaro cactus and other sensitive vegetation that can take decades to recover, including habitat for endangered species. Tons of trash and human waste are left behind each year, affecting wildlife, vegetation and water quality. The risk of fires has increased from a 
from migrant traffic, from migrant traffic as well. I hope we can continue to work together to expand our border security through fencing and infrastructure that has proven effect, that has proven its effectiveness. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for uh, for inviting me to the uh, hearing, and letting me participate, even though I'm not I'm not a member. Uh, one reason I asked to be here is because I wrote the border fence law of 1986, uh, or, or 2006, and originally I, I wrote it to mandate uh, almost 854 miles of double border fence uh, across the smuggling corridors of the Southwest. And the reason I did that was simple: when we built the fence in Yuma over this last uh, the last couple of years. We've seen a reduction there from an astounding figure of 138,000 arrests to down to less than 4,000. That's a decrease of more than 95%. Now, we caught over 58,000 folks coming across from Mexico last year who were not citizens of Mexico. We have to know who's coming into this country and what they're bringing with them. You know, I wrote the waiver language also that was inserted in the Real ID Act, and I want to tell you, Mr. Chairman, why I did that. The last piece of fence that we tried to build in San Diego was Smuggler's Gulch. That's a four-mile stretch where cocaine and people continued to be smuggled after we built the rest of the double border fence. And we started to get sued by environmentalists. And it took us 12 years, 12 years to get that four miles of fence started at Smuggler's Gulch. That, if that rate, it would take us two or 300 years to get the southwest border fence built and that, Mr. Chairman, is the reason why I wrote the waiver language that allows the, the uh, Homeland Security <laughs> Director, uh, Mr. Chertoff, to make those waivers. I've always said that uh, it's important that we consider the tools that are necessary uh, with which to keep our agents safe, with which to make their job uh, much more effective. But fencing uh, should be utilized where it makes sense. I've always been asked, how much fencing? And I've always said, Probably 10% of the border needs to, uh, uh, we need to consider the potential uh, for fencing. I certainly don't think that we need 700 miles of border. Uh, we're having uh, many issues with the uh, areas where we have uh, installed border uh, west of El Paso, where the fence is so high and so heavy that it's now splitting apart and uh, uh, literally an individual can come through that fencing. I also believe very strongly that we're better off by working with the uh, Mexican government and working towards a solution where we both co-manage uh, the border. I do associate myself with the remarks of Congressman Reyes in regard to um, the, uh, board, the, the, the necessity of a fence and the protection of the men and women who worked on a border patrol. Um, I, and I can, I, I've, I've known this for many years since I was in the California State House and conducted a three-year study on immigration, that we have a failed policy in immigration. So you'll consider, to ha you will, may as well get used to the fact that nothing's going to change until immigration policy is taken care of, because then we would be able to hold that flow. And it's unfortunate that we have the fence being considered in the South, but not on the Canadian border but where the, the concerned terror, the terrorists that supposedly came through the Canadian border, not through the Mexican border. And we need to be able to, as Congressman Reyes say, uh, work with our uh, uh, Mexican government to address some of these issues and be a little more perceptive of what, what really needs to be done in the border where the people who are suffering will be able to have input in the process. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're here specifically to find out what the leaders and the citizens of this great city of Brownsville and, and within the district of the representation that Congressman Ortiz offers, I really think that our colleagues should pay close attention uh, on the, the sense of the community. I want to look at closely also on the treaty relationship existing between Mexico and the United States on the borderlines. And if, uh, if, if, if I'm, my reading is correct about Secretary Shertoff, given the right to waive even the borders existing of the treaty relationship uh, between Mexico and the United States, we have some very serious problems here. We need to address illegal immigration, drug trafficking, and the violence that happens on our communities. These problems, however, will not be solved by constructing a wall that tears through our public and historical lands forces our citizens to surrender their property 
and reverses all the work and investment the Congress and the local community have done to protect the natural environment. Yet our communities are not even being given the opportunity to truly, to truly voice their concerns. The people along the American borders are the most impacted by border security policies. We all support border security, but simply ask for smart policies. By now we have all heard about the Department of Homeland Security decision to waive 36 laws that protect our health, environment, and quality of life with the stroke of a pen. If they were able to waiver, to waive these 36 laws, what is next? Let me welcome all of you and begin uh, the, the panel discussion with uh, Mr. Rick Schultz, National Borderline <coughs> Coordinator, Department of Interior. Welcome, sir, uh, your testimony. Uh, DOI, through its agencies, takes very seriously its responsibilities to administer uniquely beautiful and environmentally sensitive lands along the southwest border. Recognizing their ecological and cultural values, we strive to maintain their character on behalf of the American people. Unfortunately, the safety and, of our visitors and employees on DOI lands has been compromised by drug trafficking and illegal immigration. Natural and cultural resources have been adversely affected by the illegal activities. These impacts include destruction of wildlife habitats and the dumping of trash and vehicles along the border. We have made it a priority to work closely with DHS as they seek to construct 670 miles of border fence by December of 2008. Still, there have been some challenges related to DHS's extremely compressed time frame and the complexity of the issues. Although some of our ecological co communities may recover due to the infrastructure, the footprint of the pedestrian fence with associated access roads results in other adverse impacts. These Im impacts include inhibiting the movement of certain wildlife species, some of which are threatened or endangered species. Within national wildlife refuges and wilderness areas, our governing statutes prohibit us from permitting the construction of certain border security infrastructure, and we informed DHS of these facts, and they ultimately chose to exercise their waiver under the uh, Real ID Act. Securing our nation's diverse border terrain is an important and complex task that cannot be resolved by a single solution alone. The installation of fencing has proved to be an effective tool to slow, redirect, and deter illegal entries, especially in certain areas where personnel and technology alone cannot sufficiently secure the border. We believe the effort to stem illegal border cross-border activity in certain areas of high traffic will result in an improvement to the environment. No land will be ceded to Mexico. Thanks. Thank you, Chief. I'm Chad Foster, Mayor of the City of Eagle Pass and Chairman of the Texas Border Coalition. You're in a place today where the blending of cultures is unique. Farmers irrigate, irrigate from the river, ranchers water their herds in the river, and children are baptized in the river. It truly is a river of life. Illegal border crossing arrests at the Texas-Mexico border have been falling for more than two years without a wall, a great tribute to the deterrence of our Border Patrol and Border Protection agents. Arrests this year alone the southern border are likely to, or roughly going to be half of the nearly 1.6 million we saw during the peak of the year 2000. We are winning control of the borders between the ports of entry, and that puts our ports under greater stress. According to the Government Accountability Office, we need 4,000 new officers to secure the ports of entry. Most undocumented aliens entered the United States through ports of entry. Most illegal drugs enter the United States through ports of entry. No border wall will solve those problems. Early last summer, we were notified of plans by the Department of Homeland Security to build a fence 18 feet high on top of the levee on the university's, um, on the levee north of the university's iTech campus, essentially placing all of the iTech on the Mexican side of the fence. In addition, the plans would also build a fence 18 feet high on top of the levee just south of the Scorpion baseball field and of our parking lot, essentially placing our entire golf course on the Mexican side of the fence. In October, we received a letter from U.S. Customs and Border Protection asking for a right of entry onto the university property. The right of entry was refused because it was meant to support preparations for the building of a fence that would jeopardize campus security. DHS has repeatedly reported to us that they plan to build a fence on the levee for the purpose of channeling illegal entrance to a point, presumably, for easy apprehension. 
that point is the same opening in the fence that would also be used for entry and exit to the golf course. I could not sign the original right of entry because having an opening in an 18-foot high fence for the purpose of channeling all illegal entrants, including criminals, <coughs> into the heart of our campus would greatly endanger, not protect, our students and jeopardize campus security and safety. Many have worked for decades to design a campus that is respectful of the natural and rich environment of this very special ecological zone. Signing the right of entry would have jeopardized the ecological systems of our region and obstructed the development of a campus environment. I thank you for the time you have spent on our campus. There are many others in the audience that do not have the, the honor of being able to address you. But, but just so you know, there are many voices that have similar feelings to what you have heard from the mayor and from others on this uh, podium today. Thank you so much. Thank you all for your testimony. I do not know of anyone, either in the Border Patrol or the administration, certainly I have never thought of a barrier along the southern border, no matter how long, as the solution, as the solution to the problem with illegal entry into this country. It is just simply part of a solution. It just helps us begin to control parts of the border where we, know, where we presently do not have that control. The thing we're arguing about today is not the simplistic application of uh, uh, some sort of barrier that will then solve all of our immigration policies or problems. That is certainly not the case. I understand that. Um, in all this process, uh, I don't see the Department of Homeland Security represented here. And I'm not sure why. In order to be able to get uh, 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 answers from some of the agencies, uh, we need to have them present, or at least it goes on the record. Uh, Mr. Schultz, on your second paragraph, you indicate this impact by this illegal migration, but the fences and the roads don't damage that environment. The roads and the fen roads and fences do uh, damage the uh, um, public lands as well. There has been. Uh, significant uh, discussions between uh, our Fish and Wildlife Service folks, uh, folks that work for the Bureau of Land Management and Park Service folks to try to minimize the impacts. Okay, but that's only between the agencies. What about the people that are affected, the farmers? Uh, and, and my understanding is that this was taken into a computer or set to a separate room to put in their input without public op opinion being open. I mean, we're, we're, if, if people want to be accept, uh, accept the dialogue, the, the uh, plans that you have, you have to be transparent. And if you're not, then you're going to have people sit up and say, hey, wait a minute, this is the United States. Uh, you know, folks, we're all in this together. Uh, what I've gotten from your testimony is a couple of things. Uh, one thing is that we all acknowledge you've got to control the border. Uh, and the second thing is uh, that, that there's lots of custom making to be done along this, uh, along this border to, uh, to ensure that uh, uh, that controlling the border is consistent uh, with local communities. I think if you give the chief an opportunity, if you give him the resources, the personnel, don't hang a fence around his neck. And, and of course he's sitting here, I've, I've been in his position before, he's sitting here towing the party line. He's got to, if he wants to remain chief of this, of this sector. Uh, but I, I, but I, <laughs> Mayor. Uh, in, in the context of your issue in Eagle Pass, the, there, we have been told that there are multiple uh, strategies with multiple types of fencing that, that uh, could be considered for an area like Eagle Pass. In the state of Texas where you have such a magnificent natural boundary as the Rio Grande River, we continue to advocate eradicating the Carrizo cane, the salt cedar, that facilitates line of sight to those Border Patrol agents, to the physical banks of the river. Let, let's upgrade our technology, our sensors that are embedded in the banks of the river, and let's get more boots on the ground because these gentlemen have a tireless job, but they are so very successful. In our Texas border, I think statistically speaking, apprehensions are down somewhere in the neighborhood of 78%. Conversely, on the California border, where you do have physical barriers, uh, memory serves, apprehensions are up somewhere in the neighborhood of 10%. So I think we can, we have controlled our Texas border. The statistics speak for themselves. 
But the analogy is we've got a kitchen sink with a broken pipe. Instead of sending in a plumber to fix the pipe, which is immigration reform, we keep sending in more mops. Uh, Mr. Schultz, you mentioned that under your, your testimony saying that you're under extremely compressed time. Uh, are you saying that come December 2008, uh, if the border fence is not up here in between Brownsville and Matamoros, there's all hell is going to break loose? Um, Mr. Congressman, that's, that's not my decision. Uh, what we're trying to do is respond to the request in a timely fashion that we receive from Homeland Security for uh, access to the lands. And Mr. Michello, you said that no land will be ceded to Mexico. And after listening to Dr. Garcia's testimony, the whole uh, golf course is going to be given away. Am I correct in the way the fence is being proposed here? As currently proposed, the fence will be north of what is the golf course now. But our activity with regard to enforcement, the enforcement footprint, if you will, that is exercised by the Border Patrol will remain as it is today. We'll be patrolling the river by boat as we do now. Agents will be on the river's edge and using the levee roads and the roads that are constructed along with this fence to patrol the border much in so, the same manner that we are so now. So the, the good sides. citizens of Brownsville have to get permission in order to go to play in golf? That's not correct. We're, we're, we're going to be present on both sides of that fence. I'm speaking just for Congressman Ortiz's district. What's the total mileage that we're talking about in borderline between Mexico and the U.S.? Uh, I, I'm not sure the, the, the jurisdiction of the district. My area, the Rio Grande Valley sector, is 316 miles U.S.-Mexico border. And uh, there's going to be fences in that whole 300-mile stretch? No, that's, that's not correct. We're, we, we've got, uh, I don't know how many segments, so, but if you add up the segments that we've requested, um, it's just under 70 miles. So there's some exceptions. There, there are not exceptions. What we've looked at were the activity levels and, and, and made an assessment of where fencing would assist us in the work that we do. They don't think they can go around those 700 miles and go through those 1,300 miles. What have we done? Chief, maybe you can help me. Are we doing anything on the Canadian border? I'm, I'm not aware of any specific projects that are ongoing with the Canadian border in regards to fencing as tactical infrastructure. Am I correct that the, uh, the, the border, the length of the border in Canada is twice as long as the Mexican side? Yes. Okay. Are we having any damages done to the fences that have been built now? I'm aware that, that once infrastructure is in place on the border, if it's not protected or patrolled adequately, that it, the damage will occur. Smugglers will try to defeat any physical infrastructure. Do you, can you give me an estimate as to how much it's cost to repair? We're, I'm happy to go back to the agency and get the sort of the nationwide wrap on those kinds of things, but I don't have that with me. Thank you. And we appreciate the work that you do. And I know that sometimes you're mandated by higher ups and you, you know, we understand that. Just let me be clear, the 69.6 the miles that we've requested for the Rio Grande Valley is something that I've been able to validate since my assignment began here in July. And I would not be asking the taxpayers or the Congress or the department and CBP to, to support that if I didn't believe it was necessary. Let me thank this panel uh, very much for your testimony today. Much appreciated and invite the next panel up. At any time, if you want to go to ronwhitlock.com, you can do so 24-7 and review this program, or you can email around the world and any of your friends who wish to also see this border hearing at the University of Texas and Texas Southmost College may do so. We will continue to cover this border wall issue 24-7 at ronwhitlock.com. Till next time, adios. <laughs>